Okay, so in the previous lesson, we looked at natural mating versus artificial mating. And the first artificial mating example we looked at was artificial insemination, as we can see here in the picture on the screen. So basically, this is when a human places sperm into a cow. There is no natural mating happening. No bull is present for this to happen. So the two other examples of artificial mating we're going to look at is embryonic transfer, also known as ET. It's quicker to write down. Then also nuclear transfer, which is basically cloning. So we're going to look at these two in detail. The first one, embryonic transfer, then, is basically the removal of a fertilized ovum. It can either be the zygote stage or the blastocyst stage, meaning the egg cell has just been fertilized now with a sperm cell, but it's not an embryo yet. So it's in the early stages of development. Ah, okay, well, between basically a zygote and an embryo. That's what's called embryonic transfer. So this is removed then from a genetically superior cow and then transferred to the uterus of a genetically inferior cow. So I just want to point out here the two terms superior and inferior is kind of relevant to what the farmer thinks is superior and inferior. So it's based on opinion, meaning if the farmer wants to produce cows that produce a lot of milk, the ones with those genes that create offspring that produce a lot of milk, that would be your superior cow. The inferior one then in this case would be the one that generally does not produce offspring that creates a lot of milk. So it depends on what the farmer wants, what he's trying to breed. So he decides then what is superior and what is inferior. So again, this entire process, what's the point? So the purpose basically is to quickly improve the genetic potential of a herd. So the farmer can use this method to basically um, quickly, within a year, within two years actually, um, improve his herd and then all the individuals in his herd can then produce a lot of milk, all the females, all the females that are produced. Um, even with the bulls, if a bull is born, then its offspring, if it's a, a female, a heifer, can then produce a lot of milk. So it depends on what the farmer wants. And this is a quick method, a quick method to improve the genetics of a farmer's um, cattle. Well, it can happen for any animal, but let's stick to cows for now. Okay, so then terms associated with this entire process, we're going to look at exactly what happens. So again, how does this, how is the embryo removed from one cow and placed into another one? So the first term that we have to look at is called superovulation. So basically superovulation means that more than one graphene follicle develops in a cow and then it releases an egg cell. So meaning for every graphene follicle that develops, there will be an egg cell that is released. So usually with superovulation, Remember, you've got two ovaries, and the female cow has two ovaries. So per month, um, theoretically, two egg cells can be released if two graphene follicles develop. Usually in nature, this does not happen. Usually only one ovary, either side of the fallopian tube, um, produces an egg cell. But with superovulation, the animal is treated with hormones so that two egg cells is produced every month. Again, why? Why would we want to do this? Because then this individual can um, be fertilized and give two embryos instead of one, and both those embryos can be removed from this one cow, and then two other cows can be, um, or the embryo then can be transferred to each of those other two cows. Meaning instead of this animal only having one offspring, it can now have two offsprings at the same time, um, just with different mothers. Okay, so that this happens usually during in, embryonic transfer. The second thing is the embryo flushing or embryo harvesting. Okay, harvesting sounds a bit harsh, so I think embryo flushing is a better one to use. But basically what it is, is when the fertilized ovum, so your fertilized egg cell, is removed from the donor, so the donor is the one that gives the egg cell, removed from that donor animal with a salt solution. So usually it's washed out of the, uh, out of the fallopian tubes in the uterus of this cow that has released this egg cell and this fertilized um, egg cell. So this is what embryo flushing is basically. So the a human, the vet, whoever takes this embryo, get, takes the embryo out of this female cow and that's referred to as embryo flushing. The third term here is donor again. So the donor animal is the animal from which the fertilized ovum is taken or harvested or flushed, same thing. And then lastly, for your recipient animal. So that's the animal that receives the fertilized ovum and carries the fetus until birth. So the recipient is the one that will actually give birth to the animal or give birth to the baby because the donor 
The embryo has been taken out of the donor's body and then placed into the recipient animal's body. And then the recipient is the one that actually carries this offspring and in essence is the mother basically of this offspring. So not the biological mother, but she is definitely the mother that gave birth to this offspring. Okay, so here's a nice picture showing us what happens. So firstly, we start with the donor cow at number one. And then again, this um, donor cow, the superior, genetically superior one, is treated with hormones so that she can super, ov super ovulate. So then um, number two shows us all the little follicles that it's produced. So technically, usually only two follicles can, but it depends on the hormonal treatment. I think more than the two um, graphene follicles can develop. So more than one per ovary can develop with this special chemical um, hormonal treatment. Okay, so then basically, if natural mating is not used, this cow now, uh, the donor one, is artificially inseminated with sperm because again, we want the egg cells to be fertilized. And then number three just shows us how this um, young zygote now is developing all the different stages, little cells are forming on the inside. And then at the fourth one, we have the embryo flushing. So now basically all these embryos are removed out of the donor cow's body. So from five onwards, we look at the receptor cow, the recipient. So this is the one where in the embryos will be placed. So this cow itself at number six to get ready is synchronized. So meaning for the oestrus synchronization, again, why? So that the vet can know when she actually goes into oestrus. So again, she's also treated chemically to at the beginning to stop oestrus from happening. So she must be stuck in pro oestrus. And then as soon as she is about to go into heat or when she does go into heat, um, the embryo itself is then transferred to her body. So embryo transfer happens here at number seven. So the embryo, only one embryo per cow, by the way, is placed into her body, into a uterus, because she, we only want her to have one calf. Because again, if she has twins or more than that, there could be birthing complications. So only one embryo is placed into her uterus. And then she carries basically the calf until parturition happens. And the parturition is the fancy word that means give birth. Okay, so some advantages of um, this embryonic transfer. Multiple calves of a genetically superior cow can be born within a year. So again, if you have multiple recipient cows um, and you've got multiple embryos from this one cow, she can have limitless amount of calves within one year. It depends on how much the farmer is willing to pay for every time for this embryonic transfer to happen. And then secondly, the farmer doesn't need to own a bull again to obtain sperm. So many of these benefits are the sa same as for um, artificial insemination. He can get the sperm from someone else and then inseminate his cows. Then thirdly, rapid genetic improvement of the herd, definitely. Okay, some of the disadvantages. Firstly, it is very, very expensive. So again, a farmer must have the resources to do it. And secondly, it's unfortunately a surgical procedure. So even though the flushing with the saline solution sounds simple, the cow will have to be um, usually um, put out to sleep. Um, tranquilized uh, and then again she must be cut open to actually get to the egg cell so it is a high risk procedure and then thirdly a veterinarian must be the one to do the procedure and just not anybody can do it and again vet costs are the vet costs not cheap okay so then we're going to look at nuclear transfer so this is a little bit different and again basically if you forget the definition of nuclear transfer, just remind yourself, it's about cloning. So basically what happens here is the nucleus of a somatic cell, which is the, a body cell, something like your skin cell, a heart cell, those things, um, is removed and placed inside an unfertilized egg cell that has had its nucleus removed from another animal and then placed inside a surrogate mother. So in this case, surrogate mother also means recipient. But refer to as surrogate mother because this mother then will again carry this baby until birth. Okay, so we are going to go through the steps um, in the next slide if you maybe did not understand the definition. So then basically what is the purpose of this? Produce offspring containing desired characteristics. So same one basically as the previous um, uh, um, embryonic transfer. We want to increase the genetics or specifically if there is a characteristic like an individual that keeps on producing a lot of milk or an individual that has 
nice thick muscles and we want to keep all the offspring um, that have those muscles, it can produce offspring containing these desired characteristics. So this, that's the main purpose. Then also nuclear transfer has two other purposes, usually not necessarily for cows, but for most animals. So the second reason is to clone animals for medical reasons, meaning if we want to harvest stem cells, and also for disease research. So usually they do this with, with mice, with guinea pigs, you name it, anything for medical research, to also to help humans. And then thirdly, increase population size of endangered animals. They've actually used cloning to actually keep um, the rhinos alive and certain other um, organisms as well overseas that have been um, dying out because of human interference. So they can actually, you know, I know some people have tried to bring the mammoth back to life as well. Don't know whether that has been successful, but animals that are on the brink of extinction, they've actually um, increased their numbers with cloning. So then, guys, there are two types of cloning. The first one is reproductive cloning. So literally, this is when you make clones of an entire animal. An uh, example here would be they, tr they cloned a sheep a few years back, Dolly the sheep. Uh, so they lit literally made a clone of her. And the second method is therapeutic cloning. So in this case, it's not a full clone that's made. They basically just create stem cells. So again, with therapeutic cloning, you've got sperm cell meets egg cell, get the zygote. And as soon as the zygote reach about the blastocyst phase, just before it's an embryo, they actually harvest those cells. Those cells are known as stem cells, but unfortunately when they harvest the stem cells, the little embryo dies. So meaning you can't get an animal from it. It's just to get the, the cells. Okay, so here we have reproductive cloning. That's the main one. So meaning you want the organism to survive. So what happens? You do need two different, again, in this case, we're going to use sheep. You've got a donor sheep and your recipient or your surrogate mother right over here. So what happens is what they do is they take from the one individual, the one you want to clone, you take some skin cells, um, body cells, so somatic cells. Again, in this case, it's going to be green. So let's say argument for argument's sake, it's going to be from some skin cells from this sheep we want to clone. Then the nucleus, again, the nucleus has the DNA, they remove the DNA from this cell. And it's the DNA from this cell we actually want. So we remove the cell, it's not actually what we want. We remove the nucleus because th this is the DNA, the diploid DNA from this organism because we want exactly all this DNA from this one to be in the next offspring. So we remove the nucleus, the diploid one, from the one. Okay, and then we have our recipient um, sheep, I almost said cow, and we remove the egg cell from this one because again it's basically we want to do fertilization but it's just a little bit differently. So we need an egg cell for this but then the egg cell its nucleus is removed because again its nucleus is haploid. It is half the amount of DNA but we don't want this one because we don't want the sheep. We want the sheep to look like the first one, the donor. So we always also remove the nucleus from this one it is now empty, but in this case, we still need this cell. We need an egg cell to be fertilized. So they use the egg cell, hence the, the yellow one here, but we place the nucleus from this donor sheep, which we want to clone, and we put this into this egg cell. So now technically you've got an egg cell that has been fertilized. It has a diploid amount of DNA in it. It just happens not to be half the amount from the egg cell and half of the sperm cell, it's just a full amount from the body cell of this one in the egg cell from a different sheep. Okay, so basically this egg cell just houses the DNA you want to um, copy throughout this body. So again, um, this now is seen as a fertilized ovum. It replicates, become a zygote, it becomes a blastocyst, it becomes the embryo, and then eventually um, in, inside the surrogate mother's body, and then eventually you get a young sheep. And this sheep now looks just the same as this one, in theory. Okay, so there are two techniques with this reproductive um, cloning that they use, the Roslyn technique and the Honolulu one. So for those of you guys, you have to remember the name. They never ask detail really, but please remember that the Roslyn technique, they use an electrical pulse. So these two techniques have to do with this step, the fertilization step. So when you've got your donor um, DNA in your egg cell, what they do is they shock it, literally an electrical shock. 
So that is your rosin technique. They use an electrical pulse so that this nucleus fuses with this um, egg cell. So this is the first method. The second one is instead of using electrical pulses, the Honolulu technique uses just an injection needle. So you literally just inject this nucleus into this egg cell. Then this fertilized egg cell again is placed in your surrogate mother and this into the uterus of the surrogate mother and then she carries the baby until it is born. Okay, so just remember Rosalind and Honolulu. Okay, lastly, advantages and disadvantages of your nuclear transfer. Firstly, the uh, advantage is the potential is endless supply of genetically superior animals. So meaning this you can keep on doing and quickly again have superior, a lot of genetically superior animals within a year. And secondly, stem cells of cloned embryos can be used to treat diseases and create organs for transplantation. So again, uh, this is only for your therapeutic cloning. So again, if you want the stem cells that can be used to treat diseases and yes, even create new organs for transplantation. So again, if you your <laughs> prized sheep has a lung issue, you can actually clone the lungs, grow it in another um, surrogate mother and take out those lungs and then or okay, actually that was explained wrongly wait with the stem cells you can actually remove uh, create a clone again from the embryo and from the embryo you harvest those new stem cells and then it can those stem cells could potentially become new um lung cells so they plant those stem cells into the lung of the um animal you want the organs to save and this can repair actually those um, lung cells. Either that or they actually do create a new lungs and then transplant the lungs to the organism you want to save. The possibilities are endless. And thirdly, cloning of endangered species, we talked about that, and cloning of disease resistant animals can eradicate diseases. I mean, if you clone uh, an individual that is completely immune to, let's say, okay, there's for argument's sake, so there's three diseases that is potentially um, can cause the death of an organism but this one is resistant to all three of those diseases and you clone it potentially if you have all these animals that are resistant to that disease the disease can't harm anything anymore so the disease in effect will disappear because no none of the organisms are affected by it so that's what they say it can eradicate or get rid of these diseases okay but there are obviously some disadvantages for your nuclear transfer the first one is cloned animals have half the lifespan of normal animals. This they found out with Dolly the sheep because they cloned her. Brilliant, the clone survived, but the clone did not live outlive Dolly herself. So the clone only had half the lifespan of the original sheep. Nobody knows exactly why, but again, it has to do with the chromosomes and the lifespan of the chromosomes. Secondly, if the original animal had any genetic defects, the clone will also have it. So you have to make sure that your original sheep is perfect and that you don't also clone the bad genetics because that will happen. And thirdly, cloning is controversial. Not everybody is for it. Most people are against it. Again, it's basically is a controversial topic. Nobody knows really what to think about it. And fourthly, it's expensive, definitely. Uh, I think it's going to be expensive for a long time. Then also cloned animals have a lowered immune system. This is also bad then because, again, this can also be a reason why they don't live as long as the original animal. Then lastly, offspring of cloned animals have physiological issues. And they've actually found that some um, of some of them either um, have two hearts or the heart is too small or something is wrong with their muscles. They struggle to move. So, so many things can actually go wrong with a cloned animal. So these things still have to be tweaked out and people still have to figure out how to move past this okay so again there are advantages but generally uh, there's actually more disadvantages than your advantages for nuclear transfer okay and that is it for this lesson